Good morning. While uh, Eugene was praying, my watch actually vibrated. I think I've mentioned a few times to the church that at 9.38 every morning or evening, uh, the sports movement around the world, we set our alarms to ring at 9.38 because at 9.38, we pray for one minute, Matthew 9.38. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send workers into the harvest field because the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few. And so when you prayed, Lord, send workers, harvest is plentiful, I thought, yes, that's great. Love it. Um, Last week, I was also here when Rick preached, and I thought, how I wish I could preach like Rick. Phenomenal. What a great communicator. Uh, And he, he spoke last Sunday on Luke chapter 10 specifically the Good Samaritan. I just want to make two quick remarks. The first is, when you read the first uh, passage of, of Luke 10, the first segment of Luke 10, is actually Jesus sending out the 72, two by two. And he gives them certain instructions, right? And he says, don't take this with you. Don't, don't do this. Don't do that. And as you go, do these things. You know, raise the dead, proclaim the kingdom of heaven is near. Uh, cure people of leprosy, uh, cast out demons. And then in Luke 10, he says, look for this household of peace. So about nine weeks ago, we had the International Sport Leadership School leaders here in front, and you guys prayed for them. So this whole weekend, they have actually been in, uh, they're actually in Sirius right now. And uh, Shofar Sirius has hosted them with a couple of churches from Unduli, the, the Black Township, and Bella Vista more the, the, the colored, predominantly colored area. And Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, they were responsible to go apply Luke chapter 10. And so almost all of them found households of peace that gave them a place to stay and fed them last night. So all in faith, trying to live out Luke chapter 10. Okay, so that's cool. Luke chapter 10 also is where you find the Good Samaritan. And I want to make a few remarks related to that. Um, You know, many times we think in the parable of the Good Samaritan, the bad guys are who? The priest and the teacher of the law. Why? The Levite. Why? Because they walk by. Recently, I realized they're not actually the bad guys. You know why? Because those two guys actually were obeying the Ten Commandments when they did what they did. Where were they heading? They were heading to Jerusalem. Why? Probably to fulfill some kind of priestly duty. And so they were probably heading to the temple. They probably had duties. And if you read Exodus 30, um, Leviticus 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and a lot of Leviticus, it says to the priest what you should and should not do. And one of the things you should not do is to be unclean, especially when you're heading to the temple. So why did they leave that guy on the side? Because they were seeking to obey the Mosaic law. They had duties. And they made a choice, the right choice, according to Mosaic law. So sometimes the issue is not about good or bad, right or wrong. They did the right thing. But I think what Jesus established is not choosing between right and wrong, but choosing between kingdom and right. You see the difference? So what is kingdom? And I think it supersedes what is right. So if you own a business, what would kingdom be if you have creditors. You don't pay them 30 days accounts receivable, you pay them 25 days or 20 days or 15 days. That might be kingdom. I'm not prescribing. I'm just saying think about that. Maybe kingdom means you don't short shares. You don't ever short if you're a trader. Because what is shorting? I, I, you guys, some of you don't understand. Don't worry about it. So what would kingdom living mean if you're a teacher, a garbage collector, a pastor, a 
missionary, business owner. What is kingdom? What is right? And so Jesus set the standard off in the, in the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's not who is your neighbor because that is somewhat passive. Kenneth Bailey, one of the professors in uh, theology, lived in the Middle East and he read, read, writes some phenomenal, phenomenal books to bring insight into, into that time. He says, maybe the question that Jesus is putting to us is not who is my neighbor, but who must I be a neighbor to? Therefore, wherever you are, that's the question you should ask. Lord, who is before me, wherever I am, that I must be a neighbor to? Okay? So it's flipped. Choose kingdom, not right or wrong. Right is assumed. You should do right. Why are we even talking about what is right and wrong? Right? Okay, so this morning's sermon will be essentially three parts. The first part will be a um, few words that I'll say. The second part is I have a friend that we're going to interview. And then the third part is we're going to spend time in prayer. So the prayer part is important. So it reminds me of a story. There's this guy who saved a ton of money and he was super excited to go buy his new car. He went to the car showroom. He bought the car. Then he drove it home, proud, happy, excited, rubbing the dashboard and just smelling the smell of a new car. Drove into the driveway, got out of the car. The daughter came running out of the house. Daddy, daddy, where's mommy? Well, you know, mommy was left behind in the car. Dealer. So this morning, the prayer is the mommy. We don't want to leave mommy, leave mommy behind. Um, one of the things that we've been wrestling with as a sport movement, and also this is not just sport movement, but also urban uh, missions, is the whole subject of urban missions. Okay, so in the world of missiology, part of the discussion is, where is the world moving towards? And right now, it is said that 83% of the world is probably urban. So if the world is urban, do we need to revisit our mission strategies? Because are our methods primarily rural that we're trying to superimpose into urban missions? Okay? So what does it take to reach a city? What does it take to disciple a city? So that's one of the big conversations that's happening right now in the world of global missions. Now, we all live in a city, so this is super relevant to us. And if you read the epistles, Paul writes to the city. Notice that it's not to a local church. He writes to the church in Ephesus, the church in Colossae, the church in Jerusalem, well, Antioch. It's always about the city-wide church, not to the church of Shofar Stellenbosch. Okay? It's always to the city. Um, so I'm usually a fan of anything related to citywide, you know, mobilization. Uh, not everything is necessarily strategic, but more often than not, it's a great reminder of uh, being involved in something larger than ourselves. We all have this myopia, you know. Come join us, come support what we do, but when others do something, we don't support what they want to do. Yeah? So anything related to city city-wide partnering, I think is, is typically a good idea. Now, the basic, the baseline for how we can support something of the city is clearly to pray together. Okay? So prayer can often be that baseline. So when people speak like this, reaching a city, discipling a city, seeing a city for Christ, what, is that even possible? So the rational and the logical among us will say, What's metric for success? How do you define success? Is it even possible? And I think you can go to um, Jonah chapter 3 and you read about a whole city uh, that, that Jonah in three days and people estimate that the city was probably 60 miles uh, containing between 120,000 people to 600,000 people. 
So that's the city of Nineveh, uh, present-day Iraq. And um, in three days, the whole city went into mourning and re repentance and lamentation in sackcloth and ashes, and the city was redeemed. So it looks like it is possible, at least from Jonah chapter 3. One of the things that might need to happen is for us to think about the access points of a city, the gates of a city, okay? So it's quite interesting that every ancient city you go to, there are always gates, ramparts, walls. So I've been to Persepolis in Shiraz, and, and it's the same there. You know, you go to the Great Wall of China, you go to all the different castles. Look, even the Zalza has gates and walls and fences, right? Dalke Fonden. Disney World, same thing. So people seem to understand that you have walls, you have access points. And so the question that's being asked right now, at least for the city of Cape Town, is what are those gates? Where is the battleground that we need to be at? What are those portals? What are those gates? Where the battle of the heart, the mind, the soul, the spirit is being waged. And um, so one of the things I've recently become engaged in is, is, is trying to understand that part. And uh, somehow the Lord has orchestrated where, where there's an opportunity with, to sit with certain people in the mayoral committee of Cape Town, uh, people responsible for urban design, integrated development planning, and et cetera, et cetera. And so you look at the whole city of Cape Town, and now the question is, where should we establish war rooms for prayer? What are those gates? What do we need to do to establish God's presence, so we can take back the city for God. So tomorrow, um, I'll be hosting a group of urban planners uh, from different groups across the city of Cape Town in my home, and we'll, we'll be speaking about, about that. Wednesday afternoon, we'll meet with an elderman who has opened the doors and said, we want you to speak into the integrated development plan. We want you to identify the gates. We want to challenge the church to mobilize war rooms, okay? So all this is happening sort of on the side uh, to other things that I do. But I say this mainly to help you understand that there is a lot at stake. And so when we pray later this morning, and as you continue to pray, you will realize that, um, that there is a strategic set of initiatives around what it takes to redeem cities. And in order for us to pray strategically and tactically, Sias and Eugene graciously agreed that this morning I could invite a friend to join us for the service today and this evening. And uh, his name is Eric, Eric Hoffmeyer. Eric has been a friend of mine for many, many years. Uh, when Wan Yi and I moved here 12 years ago, uh, Eric was the one that handheld us, basically to help us understand uh, ministry in primarily the, the colored areas of the city. Uh, so with him, we served in Cryfontein and in Mannenberg, and we went into Kailitsha and Mitchell's Plains and Edward, and you know, all these gangsters' paradise, we, we hung out with Eric because Eric's own background was he, that the Lord redeemed him from that life of gangsterism at a very, very, very high level. And so if, you, if anyone knows Eric today in the city, it's because he's known as the pastor that gang leaders would invite to bury their gang members when they die. So he's here this morning, and basically Eugene and I will form that panel. We'll just ask him a couple of questions. Uh, we've read a lot about what's happening in, in the city of Cape Town, uh, what's happening in the Cape Flats, and instead of just operating off what we hear from social media or News24, let's ask Eric what's going on. Then we will divide, uh, then we will basically move through stages of prayer, starting with strategic prayer. And Eric will give us a couple of things we can pray together in clusters. Then we'll move into tactical things and then operational things. Okay? So just help me with the time. Uh, please. All right, great. So Eric, Eric is married to Carol. Come. And um, they've got children and grandchildren. And it's been our journey. 
It's a joy to journey with him. Eric. Good morning. Very good morning, Seth. Yeah. Uh, just give us a few minutes, two, three minutes of your own testimony and how you came to the Lord. My testimony is what we would call in the Cape Flats from a disaster to a pastor to serve the master. <laughs> um, I was a general in the hard livings and God saved me in my bedroom. I challenged God. And my challenge was if you're not just a white man's God, then you've got to prove yourself. And the Lord is faithful. He heard my voice, and as I heard him, he told me, read Genesis chapter 12. And so I read Genesis chapter 12, and then the next day I gave notice to my work. Um, the Sunday I went to church. I sat in the fourth row, and the Lord, through his servant, Dr. Fred McCoy, pointed at me and said, young man, God called you full-time to the ministry. The Monday I went full-time. On the 3rd of September, I was 33 years old, by the grace of God. I'm now doing the master's work. Tell us uh, why young people, colored young people specifically, join gangs. Why did you join the gang? For me, it was most of um, fatherhood. It was a fatherless in my house. And then when I got about 10 years of age, my mother remarried to a wonderful man. Um, but basically, there was no role model. There was no um, opportunity for me. And my role model were my senior brother, um, who was the god, one of the godfathers of the hard livings. And for him, it was more on those days were more political motivated for a young men who had top um, marks in school but couldn't come into university. And so as a cluster of young men, they started a gang culture, not because they wanted to be gangsters. They are, since they are educated, but they have chosen wrong. Um, for me, my brother was my role model. There was an absence of, of, of fatherhood. And, and today, within our culture, you will find it's an offspring because there's a cousin, there's a nephew, there's a family member already involved in gang culture. So it's much easier to link onto that. And then there's a false promises with false hopes of having the girls, having the boys, um, having four cars. You can, you can have it. That's the protocol, which is all concluded within false promises, and then most of all your safety is guaranteed because your community is divided within very, very small clusters, and in every cluster there's now just gang culture jumping up, and then which brings the peer pressure or another way. Is it possible to get out, and what is the cost of trying to get out? Um, the, the truth is blood in, blood out. That still stands. I know when I got saved, um, I told all the generals, I was the senior of the generals, while most of the name tags that you hear on TV or on the newspaper were in prison. So I literally started the hard living in Mitchell's Plain, uh, but coming from Mannenberg, um, then when I accepted the Lord, I needed to tell the other 12 generals, of one of whom the church had been involved, um, Solomon Stachy, and I said to him and the other 11 generals that, God has saved me and I'm moving out of the gang. And he was the very one who told me about his blood in and blood out. And I knew that. And so I needed to go to the gardens to have a fight. So I wasn't scared of the fight. But they have planned more than a fight. And since that day, while we walked to the gardens to have a blood in, blood out fight, knowing that I could lose my life, or the second, second option where you go and kill an enemy, so if you kill an enemy, they take their protection away from you, um, but then you still need protection because now you're, you, you, you're on your own, you're a lone ranger. So the brotherhood then keeps you accountable for that, and then when somebody squeals on you, because be assured there is some gang members that get a tax number by the police. So they are the informers also for police services. So it could easily be somebody then, if I take, took out somebody that I could be pimped and then do a term of 25 years life. Um, but the Lord sent in a super natural way, sent that um, five police vans pulled out from nowhere and everything just was canceled. And God took me literally out of the community of, an, of, of Mitchell's Plain. Literally took me out. Describe what is happening in the Cape Flats, but leave out what the church and what the church is doing. Just speak about what is the state of the, the, the Cape Flats right now. Uh, 
even with well, after the move, the army moving in. The Cape Flats is in chaos. Um, let me speak about the upper upper class. Upper class is a civil war waiting. These are the boys and girls that goes to school, like uh, Weinberg High, Weinberg Boys and Girls Schools. These are the Monument Park girls and boys who are saying. Because there's a culture that they hear on TV, on news, that we will take your land. The colored community is saying we are fed up and too much was taken. And now there's a civil war among young boys, literally from 12. They're not associated with any gang. But I can promise you where you find 10, there is at least a gun or two amongst them. Because they're already protecting themselves in a protocol, they say, we will not let go of what our parents had worked for because that is our inheritance. So there's uh, currently something breathing like in the deeper wat waters than we just thinking about your, your gang culture within the community. But even within our gang culture, it's, it's a war zone. The boy that was 14 year old from grade eight, grade, say grade seven, he's not prepared to go to grade eight as a bully. Because he was a prefect, he was a class monitor. And in that three weeks of school holidays, gang culture ropes them in boy or girl. And they are empowered. And in the colored community, seven out of ten boys and girls that were in grade eight, grade seven, supposed to start eight the next year, goes to school. And not even half of them continue to excel in half of the year. So our community is, 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 not, is a heartbeat at this very moment. 14-year-olds hire guns by the gang lords. They pay a 1,000 and for a gun. That's a guarantee. And that gun must come back to the, to the gang leaders of certain gangs after they have hired the guns. They're not gang members. They just hire guns to do the evil for the day to justify where they are self at currently. But if they lose that gun to being arrested or lose it on the way while they will pitch it. They must become in association with the gang or die. Um, so there's no breakaway in our community from literally what is happening right, right now because of just of some steps that is, is circling itself into the bigger pool where you go to prison and you come part of the number gang. Um, it's wicked and it's evil. Has the army being present helped or not? The army has been present, um, don't be fool. It's not working. It's not working. That's personal opinion and I can stand for that. Um, I saw, this is why. Army arrest a gunman in my community of Hanover Park um, while standing at the school gate. It was nine o'clock in the morning. By three in the afternoon, I saw him again I, and I mentioned his name and I spoke gang language, what we call Sambela. And I spoke to him gang language and he told me, in layman term, as I would say to the church, he says, Pastor, they can't do me nothing. I was arrested by um, the army and not SAPS. Army cannot lay a charge against me. That is not their mandate. So I said, but wow, but truly there must be a statement. He said, yes, there is a statement. But if they keep me there, I'm the informer, by the way, Pastor. So a guy who had a gun in his hand, 14 bullets, with a gun, in less than six hours, he was back into my community. Less than six hours. So where I'm concerned, the army is not um, working. They may arrest various individuals. It is true, you may read it as so, but go to the office and ask, where is the individuals that were um, taken in by the army? You will not even find 50% of them there or 10% because it's a crossover of job subscription currently being fought in parliament and in our leadership building. So it's not working. Uh, maybe for this discussion, specify a community that you're spending the most ministry time in. What are the needs of the community right now? Just high level. Currently, I am in an overpark. Um, I've served my, my schools all my life. Um, there's at least 10 young people that work with me and currently all five of them are staying at my home right now as we speak. Um, so we work in, in the schools, but all of them were gang members. 
So I come to understand the culture that I had in the gang and I just applied godly into from scripture and I implemented into their lives. They don't get paid. They are given in kind. Who I ask, glad they have in more than one, one way. But these men, currently as they serve in the school, we have soccer clubs, they teach maths. I've got three ex-gang members that are teaching maths in high school. Um, I got five of them that have completed um, degrees in while they were serving between them 300 years in prison uh, with their sentences. But they've done 25 years at least to society. And every week they meet with me at these ones. And then they go out in the community serving schools and they also serve um, clusters of communities where it's a protocol of making disciples. Um, and in the discipleship, they are also coaches and they are also fathers. And that is how we, we basically operate as a father, as a coach, and, and as an educator with, within our school. And for us, it's, it's working. Just for example, we are currently looking forward to take 25 of these boys. Last year, half of them were too young for the men's, uh, mighty men's conference. We're taking 25 of them. I've, I've pledged to, to be with them. We're asking people to contribute because these are the little nuggets difference that we are, are making within our community. So we have taken some of them over, overseas. They are part of powerlifting, weightlifting, bodybuilding. They are part of soccer teams. We, we, done, we use what we have. So the park is our cathedral. The street is our cathedral. That is how we minister. The ball is our Bible. That's how we just minister. Sports ministry is our, basically my first passion. And I use that as a as a tool. We have one school that just gave me a, a three blocks. It's going to become a gymnasium. The school itself have already invested 70,000 rand. Already invested without government help. But just asking. But they've given us now all three classes and we're going to start to jump through um, families of the ministry that basically now. So things is happening with, within our communities where ministries is, is just saying young men say Young ladies say, God have called me. Just for example, I led a couple to the Lord from the street. They were unsafe. It was the prostitute and the pimp. They're doing currently good. Then I bought a bungalow. We just extended the bungalow. Um, it's, it's on my house property in Cryfontaine. We got eight babies there, and we're working with street ladies on the street. Not supported by the government. But all I know that 33 years ago, God called me in my bedroom. That's all I know. If I ask John for a hundred rand, he'll give me the hundred rand. So I ask him to buy food. That's how I roll. So there is individuals that God has saved, that have paid their time to society, that say God has called them for a time such as now. We don't have it all. But one thing we do know, he who began the good work within us is more than, than faithful to complete it. Top three needs of Hanover Park and what is the Hanover Churches doing about it? For us in Hanover Park, um, I believe that our men and, and our women that are full-time in ministry, they, they need to be sustained. Um, secondly, the client that we need, uh, that we work with, needs to be empowered more. For example, I see your camp. So I say to the church, church I've just started 25 new boys, a soccer club. They are, these are the bad boys at one school. So the principal, principal calls in and the governing body, Pastor Eric, we cannot give them outside of the gate, but they're playing truant in the school. They only attend my class, okay? So the school give me two hours, five days a week, and I just bless them, and Muslim and Christian by name, in the class. They are willing to go on a camp. Pastor Eric, we don't have money. So for church, you have a camp? I've got 25 boys. Sponsor them, and the Lord saves them. So, so this is just a, a vehicle need that I'm I'm saying, so we have that need, that we need the boys, the, the harvest is there. There is laborers there, but the laborers also need to be empowered. I also saw the ministry. This is our problem in our community. There's foreigners coming into our land. They come into our land with the Bible schools, with the education. But the truth of the matter is, it is not credited in South Africa. And then we have split churches. We have guys that become bishops. I'm 23 years in service. I'm still a servant. We get titles because an institution outside comes in, give a guy a three months 
crash course and becomes a bishop. I have a problem that, oh, he's a prophet. I don't discourage the call of God. I discourage the method how things are being done. So, so far, church, you have something in your hand. I have a community that I serve. I say, give on the battle and partner with it so that we can raise up the men and women that says, we believe that God has called me to serve. We have the young people and the young boys that say, I want to change. I want to, to be different. But is it all just about this community where, where I am at? I took 30 young people to Weinberg Gardens. They're 18. They've never been in Weinberg Gardens. So if the Lord haven't placed me in Weinberg, they, I, I'm saying just between brackets, they may have never seen Weinberg Gardens, even if they were 30, by the way. So I'm saying, so 30 young men, I took to Weinberg Gardens for a liquor bride, borrowed money, not my own, but for boys that have not seen Weinberg yet, but yet they've been in Paul's more, more than twice. They've seen Constantia Mountains, yes. They've seen the vineyards of Constantia, but not Weinberg Park. Less than 15 minutes drive from the front door. What would you say keeps that community bound the way that it is bound? There's a, first, there's an evil, evil unity. Because it is sons and daughters. It is cousins and nephews. It's family members that are part of gang culture. And not easily when a, a, a crime is committed that the, purpose, the perpetrators will be given up or they will sell up. It's one in a million where a mother will say, if my son is guilty, he must go to prison and even the rot there. They will use that word. That's a guarantee. They will even use the words that is not found in dictionary um, that, that we found with on the forms. Um, but then you will, you will find where, where there's a sad point, and, and, and allow me to say this. Um, I've, I've lost a son six years ago. But the same perpetrator have killed four sons before that. And the community was not willing to testify of who the perpetrator is. And so my community is united in fear. And the church is a sleeping giant because we fear ourselves for our lives. We are not willing to lay down our lives. And laying down your life means I need to come face to face. And there is a different calling to coming face to face. We all have different callings. But I believe if you, if you stay in the community and you believe and you say God has called you to this very community, then I must serve face-to-face -face friendship evangelism counts. My voice must be heard. The, the community gangsterism must know me and every house must know me, saved and unsaved. Therefore, as John rightfully said, and I was challenged by Um Kasi Kastens, I, I call him Um, and I know him for 30 years. Um, he said to me, Eric, the time must stop now that you bury the gangsters. It would not be a fashion for me to have three services one day. On one day. On a Saturday, I would just allow time for the coffin to come in and come out. The, the families must go through the back door as the other family come into the front door. Churches would not give their, their accommodations. I would do funerals, three funerals one day in a community school or a community home. And that is where I've earned most of my salary for most of 15 years. But our community is united with evil. But the sleeping giant must rise. And the sleeping giant is so confined in having church. They do pray. It happens. Our little churches, they do pray. God moves through their prayers. But there's a content of being just more active in your local community. And that's where we're not rising, raising the ball currently. One last question, and then I want you to uh, give us some guidelines on how we can be praying. What can we learn from gang culture with regards to our disciple-making? The church does it already. 
but we must continue to extend the boundary. We, we, we move in cluster denomination and we move in, in, in cluster what we call in churches regions because we baptize or full gospel or Pentecostal, but we have not allowed ourselves to move out of that. In gang culture, we, we call it the firm. And I promise you the firm just on um, Friday night at the Big Brai. They are leaders in 28s, 27s, 26s. They control our communities in from prison and outside prison. But every leader, though they are in different gang number in prison, they also serve the hot living Americans, the junkie funkies, you name it, these are the, the names. But at least once a week, they come together as the firm. And then they look as a firm, whom, whom are the next potential among them own and even outside of, of the circle, whom they can draw into that family. And it's literally called mentorship. It's literally called fatherhood. It's literally called discipleship. But they do it all on the wrong protocol. And they love the book of Philemon. Read the, the book of Philemon. That is their book. Um, John mentioned about um, um, this is the book of the young man being called and saying to God, God, um, I don't want to go to Nineveh. Those Jonah and Philemon, that is where they are allowing themselves to, to come from. They believe that Moses is a 28. He's the book of the law. He was a man of the law because they stand for the law. Um, Elijah, the 27, is the killer. He called heaven, fire from heaven. And he said, let, let your God be God. And Jesus said to Peter, go to the river. And he go fetch the coin out of the first fish. The 26 is a robe. He wants to rob us. You see, so they believe in all these content which unite them very strong from scripture. So we know the truth and the, and the, and the truth set us free. I'm not going to tell you how to run your church. I'm going to tell you how to run your community. I'm saying let us become Bible based. Let us do what God has called us to do as a church so that we can, so that the, the gang cannot show a finger at us. But the gang can say, truly, we need to deny where we, we're at and acknowledge where you guys are, are going to. So let's do the following. If you can organize yourself into small groups now, clusters of uh, three to four people. And then Eric will say a few things and then we'll spend three minutes praying and then he'll say a few other things and then you spend three minutes praying, okay? Then we'll go through a few cycles of different thematic areas for prayer related to the city, the Cape Flats, and so on and so forth. So sit in a circle, uh, sit with someone you might not know. Okay, so if you're in your groups, uh, Eric will just share briefly uh, two or three strategic things that we can bring to God before, uh, before God in prayer. Pray for our pastors, that there will be unity within the body of Christ. We have pastors coming all over from Africa into South Africa, into the southern point of where we are all at. Uh, we, we do not need to compete, but we must complete one another. Um, so let's just pray that, that God will bring the unity amongst us. We may differ on our language and our culture, but we are all Jesus freaks. And, and we should unite in, in that. That's our ultimate goal. Okay, church unity. Are there one or two other things? Yeah, church unity. And then also that, that same spirit will flow with, within, the, within our local community. You see, so if we follow the, the sheep, follow the shepherd. So, so that the sheep will know that they are one sheep. You know, so also for the community of our, our boys and girls that are in the church, that they should rise up to their call and their identity. Because of peer pressure, there's always an opportunity to become lukewarm. There's always an opportunity. I can still be in a nightclub Friday night and not in my community. You can't be on Friday night in a nightclub and Sunday morning in church. So just pray for that identity 
uh, amongst our community and that peer pressure of wannabe. Okay, so clarity of call, uh, clarity of who the master is, uh, leading of the spirit, church unity, you know, all of that. So three minutes, ready, set, go. In Jesus' name, amen. Eric, uh, how can we pray for local government in the context of the Cape Flats, local government involvement? Um, just a few years ago, I said to the mayor, I said to him, I think you should resign, I'll take your job. Um, I can share it for that, you can quote it, but I said it to him in his face. Um, too many promises have come to my community. Too many promises have, have been made to people. People, it's just over the head. Um, but pray that people will understand who God is. And God also make promises. And God's promise is yea and amen. But it remains with seek first the kingdom of God. And all my righteousness and everything will be added. There's a doing of man in the community. Man is to deem to do his part. And God is always really wanting to do his part. So that we should draw to God as a people, as a community, people, and then those in leadership that we must pray for our government, especially our Christian brothers and sisters. It's not about what political party you belong to. It's about how you hear God's voice to make a difference and be the difference. Let's just pray that God will empower them with wisdom and, and understanding and discernment 
how to move that is not about them, but it's about the kingdom of God in them and through them. Okay, great. Local government, three minutes, ready, set, go. Thank you, Father God. Thank you. Jesus name amen Eric uh, so we talked about gates and portals and access points in your opinion what are three things uh, in the city of Cape Town that we need to be watchful over as a, as a gate yeah currently there's a, a very big or let me say high um, unemployment rate especially with within the city of Cape Town very very high unemployment rate and, and it filters through through all communities currently. And and that brings about also what we see lately on the new xenophobia. But it, it we continue to thank God because it's not in the church. So the church remains to be, well, let me say the word, I, I made the wrong word, the example. It may be the wrong word. But the church needs to be the example to the world. Um, the world and, and, and media sometimes turn it a bit to, to out of proportion but there is truth in it there is a xenophobia there is because of the hopelessness situation because the, the not to be work there's no um, income truly that the man must go work so you find that people is doing prostitution you find people is um, um, stealing the crime is on the increase so just pray that uh, um, this open doors within our city must just be broken down because it's currently you'll find People because of, for example, people will come from Retreat, Levender Hill, Mannenberg, and they will come into Weinberg and, and, and Constanza. And that will be the hub for the day of making a living. But how do we make the living? 
we break in homes, we break in cars, we, we go um, shoplifting, we do all the wrong things. And at night we find again our journey home. But the evil of the day of bad is happening here because, because of, of the unemployment, because of the xenophobia things happen and so forth. So I hear you say, uh, let's pray for hope to arise in a, in a state of hopelessness. Then the other is, is obviously the restoration of dignity because inability to work affects dignity. So let's pray for the men and the women uh, that, that are hopeless and also struggle with this sense of dignity that is afforded by work. Okay, three minutes, ready, set, go. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, for our last cycle of prayer, I'm just going to, we're going to ask Eric just to share how we can be in support of you in prayer as a person, you and Carol and your kids and grandkids and also your immediate team that are working. So are there certain things coming up in the next 30 days that we can stand with you in prayer for, after which the whole church, we will rise and we will just pray for Eric together. And Eugene will close. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Church, for having me this morning and for this evening, if I can say that. Um, let me say the church has been involved. So far has been involved. Um, I will take you to on a journey. Okay. One of my friends were in prison, the very one that wanted to kill me. And we spoke. I visited. That was in Polsmo. And then he one of your members went to visit him while he was in, in, in prison and then he came out because one of the cases was kicked out of prison and um, out of the system and then he came out and he came to see me. But he came to see me one Monday morning with um, Pastor Fred May and Pastor Fred May brought him to my house and Pastor Fred May sat in the car for nine hours and I was ministering to my brother for nine hours. That guy is still today saved. He's one of the teachers that teach maths at school. Did 18 years in prison. Carol and myself have helped with his family. His eldest son is today a, a qualified teacher in Dubai. His other one is a doctor at Barnard's 
hospital catching babies. And, 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 and the daughter is a, a lawyer by profession. But they don't always, or they don't all agree to what dad is doing. See, because dad's a missionary. But Solomon's walk, you are part of it. Because one plants and one throws the water and God calls it to grow. So Solomon is today in my life. I'm his spiritual father. And he's the very man that wanted to kill me when I accepted Jesus. So I could lead him years later to the Lord. But when he needed somebody to encourage him while he was in prison, it was from your church. When he needed somebody for a lift to bring him to me, it, it, it was Pastor Fred that brought him. So God had already used sofa in a, in a move to touch the hearts of, of people in our community. Now Solomon is still safe. He coaches every day 25 boys in soccer. I get a discount or, or I am sponsored by ambassadors in sport. Or I ask for people and I send him on the coaching courses. That's how we roll. So just currently, we, we have 10 young people in ministry. So next year, we want to do, I have the accommodation. Next year, we want to do a service here for Christ. We haven't asked any church within our community because it is going with the testimony and going with anything else. But we continue to ask for you to pray for us and as the Lord enable you. We are, we are looking for a van. The, the second thing is we, we, we are looking for more resources, your time, to come in, an hour or two. And if you are in grade 12 and you want to do service here for next year, come and work alongside with us. Work under your church and work alongside with us um, in the ministry. Continue to pray for us. Um, life is not easy. Um, ministry is not easy. But we need your prayers. We, we, we need, if you can, assist us financially. And, and as I said to you, uh, we are currently in our second children home. The other one is called Mary Beth. Okay, Maria and Elizabeth, Mary Beth. If we help ladies that's on the street, we take their babies, they can go to the night shelter, one of our partners. They stay there until they get clean. But if they don't want to get clean, we keep the babies because of social welfare. The pastor also that looks after our babies, Mary Beth, they were also homeless. And Pastor Eric took them in. I don't have a big house, but I take them in. And currently the house where everything is happening, I ask people, because we need every month 10,000 rand to let it go. To let it happen. So if you come see, you can come and paint it also for me. You can come put in cupboards for them. You can put in beds. I'm asking now, eh? Pastor, I'm asking. There is ministry that have gone for more than 15 years on small scale with integrity. With integrity. And we are accountable to what God has called us to. We partner, but we don't partner with government in asking them funding because then we can't preach the gospel. And where I am involved in, I preach the gospel. And, and, and lastly, we have a very strong relationship with SAPS. Pray for SAPS. Pray for the South African police services. Um, currently, they're giving us open doors, for example, on a Friday, but that's also where our one giants are sleeping. We can get every street closed during gang fights. But the church is not working with saps. Only, only the Muslims. You come in Mannenberg and I'll take you there. You come to Nova Park, I'll take you there. You will see at least hundreds of people in streets for three, four hours taking out their mats and praying. And the church is standing on the corner just watching. But our partnership with SAPS is saying, Pastor Eric, we know your work in the community for the years. We know you and we want to move with you. I had just two weeks ago, I had 30 people from Stellenbosch and Somerset West um, in what we used to call the Hawk. We were there, we ministered, we prayed there in one of the community centers. Because I wanted them to meet Hundred mothers of which my wife is one who've lost a child in the last six years. So pray for our mothers. Mothers are more standing tall because they have lost a beloved. Um, support us in, in this way with prayers because God is using again the Esthers and the Naomi's in 
in our community. I thank you. Thanks, Eric. Let's arise. God is the provider.